Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm gonna load up here in a second. There we go. Now we're live. Live. Only five minutes past time, too. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Chris, thanks for being on. Yeah. This is no really problem. sweet, Thank man. Thank you for having me. This is a cool place. Like I was telling you earlier, this is I've, the first time I've been in here. It's really, really nice, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's probably one of the nicer little tap room local brewery things that I've been in. Yeah. We got a lot of space, so we can put all the junk back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see the stock behind us right there. Well, um, I guess we'll get it started. Tell us kind of how you got started into like the brewery business or brewing beer and how this whole place, Blackwater Draw, worked out. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so we, we got started, uh, I own a bar over on Northgate. Um, that's kind of where it all started is I started actually working on Northgate back in uh, uh, 2000. And I started off working a parking lot and then I worked at a door and then I worked the floor and then moved up to bartender then I ended up managing a bar for about five years and um, and then opened my own. So that's been going on for, I've had that for 15 years now. Um, but back in 2013, um, and, and what, that, so let me backtrack a little bit. At the bar over on Northgate, we, we really feature beer. That's kind of our bread and butter there. We have liquor too, but we've always put beer above everything. And um, my business partner here at the brewery, he, uh, he worked there for a little while. And he was homebrewing beer. And so that's kind of where it all started. He would homebrew beer and we would all go over to his apartment and drink it. And, and then he ended up working for a beer distributor here in town for a few years. And uh, we just kind of got our heads together and talked about opening a, a brewery together. And uh, that's where the, the brew pub on Northgate was born in 2013. That's where we started. We had a restaurant over there on the kind of on the backside of Northgate. Um, and uh, we had that for uh, five years, and and uh, and at the same time opened this up a couple of years after that. So we were doing both locations. So that's kind of the backstory how it got started. Um, just me having uh, at that point about eight years in the of owning a bar, and uh, him home brewing for six years, and in the distribution side for a couple of years. So the business side and then the brewing side came together with you right. guys. Is mm -hmm. that kind of the way it went? Like exactly. Yeah. You know, it was really an offhanded comment. You know, we were, we we we. So the bar I own on Northgate is O'Bannon. It's an Irish pub. I love that place. And thank you. Dude, and, that's uh, awesome. Uh, so St. Patrick's Day is a big thing, and every year before St. Patrick's Day, usually Flogging Molly and Dropkick Murphys take tours around the country. So we were they were coming to Houston, and me and my business partner. His name is Chris as well. Um, we were going to see a Flog and Molly concert. And Dude, they're one of my favorite bands. And it was I at that concert. He's like, man, we should open a brew pub. And I was like, we should. You know, that'd be fun. So here we are. <laughs> That's wild. I love it how things start like that, like with an idea. and then, But it took you guys acting on that idea. Like you, you didn't just say it. You turned around and then. I had to get permission happen. from the wife. I had to go ask the wife about it. And she was on board. So she loves beer as much as we do. So. <laughs> like go for it let's do this <laughs> yeah. what what is like is it super expensive and hard to start or, because i mean if you walk through the brewery i mean i know we're not in there right now but there's you know you've got all of the the tins and stuff in the back and all of the equipment that it takes to brew it i mean you can't just did you start small like just a few little batches or did you invest fully and get the whole shebang to start out with we <clears throat> so we started off at the restaurant which was expensive because you had to get all the restaurant equipment side of it, plus the brewing stuff. And the brewing stuff, we started off with a seven barrel system, which is uh, uh, a medium size. Now, okay, when I say barrel, like one US barrel is, is basically, it's two kegs. So if I say a seven barrel system, that means that we can make 14 kegs at a time, which, you know, most craft breweries, I would say in Texas, I would say average is probably anywhere between a 15 barrel and a 30 barrel system. When you start getting into St. Arnold and Carbach and the big, big, big ones, yeah, they're they're way they're in the hundreds of barrels that they're making every batch, you know. But most craft breweries, um, seven barrel system is pretty small. So we we were in an old, it was an old house is where our restaurant was. So we had to fit a brew house and fermenting tanks into this house 
and have room for a bar and customers to sit in because you know table service to eat food and yeah so we started with that um when we opened this place we we did go bigger we have a 20 barrel here so we can brew 40 kegs at a time and then all our fermenters are are double that they can hold 80 kegs so a lot bigger on this side of it than the the restaurant side of it gosh i thought i didn't know that you brewed everything there at that little restaurant Mm -hmm. because it wasn't very big it was very small and to be honest that's really one of the uh, good reason like one of the top reasons why we we did close that is because we we want to be in the beer business we opened that to be a brewery and it had food and that place turned into it was a restaurant it was a full-scale yeah. restaurant that happened to have beer right um and it's not the direction that we wanted to go in um so when, when that lease was running out um property taxes were going up there's a lot of reasons we got out of there but also the writing was on the wall of we have our production brewery going why are we spending 90 percent of our time running a restaurant you know it's interesting you say that just because from the outside like someone like me you work on a daily basis you're like driving around you're going doing stuff um like the restaurant we go over there and grab burgers all the time and you you did think of it as a restaurant but at the same time when it closed down you're kind of like the assumption of oh, it just must have been bad business and they're closing down and maybe the brewery is totally gone. Like, you didn't mm-hmm. think of it yeah. as a brewery. So I guess you're right. You just reorganized. It's cool to hear that side of the story. You just reorganized into what you as set out to do, which is the brewery part. Yeah, I mean, at that point, we had this place and the Northgate one for three years. And we also felt we were splitting our 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 beer customers. Not Because a lot of people came for the food, right? We were splitting our beer customers between two spots. And, and we, we knew that if, if we closed that down, we would hit the ground running. Plus, we owned this building. We were renting there. So it just made more sense to use this spot to grow into. Um, you know, and, and like, it, it's, it's really what we want to be doing, if that makes sense. Like, we really want to focus on the beer. The, at that point, running two places... We only had, I'd say back then, we only had about maybe six beers on tap here. But when we closed that and we were able to bring the, the fermenters from there here, now, I mean, we, we get up to 12, 13, 14 beers on tap. So it allows us to experiment and play around and offer more to the customer. So when they come in, they're not just drinking the same five or six beers every time. Now we can rotate beers and have a new beer almost every month. All the fun stuff. Mm-hmm. All the fun stuff that you wanted yeah. to do. Yeah, the um, well, it's a cooler atmosphere here too, and on, honestly, I mean, and then I don't know, uh, like obviously I don't know this business, but is it more work worrying about the food regulations and the beer regulations together with a restaurant and brewing the beer and then selling the beer and all that good stuff that goes into those two things, or are they kind of combined into the same umbrella? The the restaurant side was definitely more of a headache. Uh, the beer side, it, it definitely has its own headaches too. But as far as regulation goes. Beer's not really regulated like food. Like the health department doesn't come in and regulate how we're making beer or um, they're not coming in and inspecting our brewing tanks or anything. There's there's no pathogen that can survive in, in beer. Yeah. So yeah. we're not going to make anything that's going to kill anybody, right? We're not making anything that's going to uh, poison anybody. So the health department doesn't really regulate that side. They, they still come here and, and, and inspect our, you know, hand wash sinks and, and stuff like that. But, yeah. Um, the headaches of running the restaurant, just staffing and, you know, food costs and everything else, that, that was a major headache that, that distracted us from what we were really wanting to do. Um, but, you know, the, the brewery side definitely has its own struggles because, you know, I, I was used to, at that point, eight years of running a bar uh, where, you know, you're getting your money every day. You're, you're, you're selling a product, you're getting your, your money every day. The hardest part for me was uh, going into this business model of a brewery is uh, you, you got to realize like you buy your, your grain, like you get your recipe to make the beer. You order it, then that comes in. It could take anywhere from two to six weeks to make that beer. So now you've already paid for the <laughs> grain, right? And, you're, and the beer's not even ready. Then um, if you're with a distributor, it, it depends on the deal you make with the distributor, but it could be you know a week, it could be two weeks, it could be... 30 days before you get your check from them. 
So by the time you decide I'm going to make this beer, you may not see any money back from selling it for two months, but you're investing up front, right? And so yeah. that, that was a big hurdle to figure out. And I think we're still trying to figure it out sometimes. <laughs> I mean, this is College Station. It's a seasonal town. So, yep. you know, Christmas break, summertime slows down. And, you know, when, when money starts kind of drying up and you're trying to figure out how busy the fall is going to be, and you got to start investing all that money to brew enough beer for the fall, but money's tight because it's slow. You know, those are all hurdles we deal with every single year. Yeah, you, every you, business does. You, you know? don't want to be out of the beat, like right. the, the product, if you get a rush of people mm -hmm. for some reason. That, that's a. I, I used to work on South Padre Island a lot, and so it's super seasonal. I mean, it's all summer and spring break, and then winter Texans. But in there's those those gaps. I mean, it's dead. Yeah. So you really got to like, I mean, the struggle of seasonal business of managing your money and inventory, the, the inventory and everything else is almost the harder part to make sure people know you're still a legitimate business. Yeah. And, and it's even harder because we can't just get something that day or the next day or even the next week. We're right. but depending on the type of beer we're making, it could be six weeks away. If something messes up and you didn't forecast right, you might be out of that beer for the better part of two months. Does you that know. count for like, so you guys are in HEB and stuff. Do you guys have a distributor that you work through? Yeah, we work with a local distributor here okay. for this town, yeah. Gotcha. And then how many HEBs do you guys, like how many HEBs and grocery stores are you in? Just locally. Just we're we're local only ones. local right now. We're uh, So we, we actually bought a van um, in uh, February of last year. And we were, uh, we were right about to start distributing to North Houston. And not, not with a distributor, we were going to do it ourselves. And then, you know, COVID hit and you know, we've been sitting on a van for a year. <laughs> well, that's another thing, like I was telling you before, like when we were chit-chatting, setting this thing up, is the I've been following all the struggles with distill. It doesn't seem like distillers have had the same amount of struggles. Some of them have, like some of them that weren't in the high end, mm -hmm. you know, that were just coming up in the in-between. But it seems like local breweries have had a tough time that's even in austin or you know around the whole state really country probably but um why why was the brewery part hit so hard like the local craft beers i i think it's because they closed for a long time they closed well they closed bars and restaurants and so you can sell an heb you can sell in specs you can sell in kroger but it's not enough you know and our tap rooms are closed you, you couldn't you couldn't come to the tap room because it was just like a bar. They were closed. So your only revenue was selling to the grocery store. That's not enough to make it. That's not enough to support you. Um, I mean, I would even argue the bigger breweries in Texas probably were hurting pretty bad when they couldn't sell to bars and restaurants. You like the I mean, like the Bud Lights, Budweiser's, all that stuff? Like you're talking those I, people? I or uh, the, I'm talking about craft the breweries. Craft breweries. I, I don't okay. think. I mean, Bud Light, they got so much money. And other <laughs> Bush has so much money. I don't yeah. I don't know if they were hurting. But, but I was, I know. guess where I was thinking was it like people go in, they want, they, do they more often than not? I mean, you're a craft brewer, so you're not stocking up like that. You don't have obviously the sales that they do. So that impacts you because more people are going in and grabbing the Bud Lights and Budweiser's mm -hmm. than they are you. So it's less money coming in your pocket because you're not, oh, of course. You're not able to diversify your money. You know, and then, and then you know, most craft breweries, they stopped like, the, the breweries were considered an essential business. We were selling HEB and stuff, so we could sell brew, and we could still sell beer to go. You couldn't come in here and get a beer, but you could come to a brewery and get a six-pack and leave with it, right? Huh. So we could still do that, which definitely helped. Um, the bar I have over on Northgate, we were dead in the water. We couldn't do anything. Oh. Couldn't sell to go, couldn't do anything. But um, How do you stay afloat with that? <laughs> a lot of crying and tears <laughs> at night curling up in a ball and a lot of bad letters to the governor and everything i don't know but, uh you know it, it, the the but what i was gonna say is like a lot of craft breweries the other hurdle for like the covid thing is you know bars and restaurants are closed so they stopped kegging beer and they were putting everything in the package because they're selling at heb they're selling to go out of their out of their warehouse um but then when the when everything started opening back up and they say okay restaurants and all that can open again nobody had kegs because we've been putting it all into cans and like i was saying now it's a two to six week time plan and like we were we went back to houston because we had made one delivery to houston and then everything got shut down 
And if you remember in June, they opened up bars for like three weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we started hitting up our bars in Houston again, and we went down there to make one more delivery. And they were, man, they were, some of them were mad at like AB, mad at Anheuser-Busch because they didn't have kegs for them. But that's because they were putting everything in the package. And it's like people were blaming the breweries like, well, they're mad. You know, yeah, you got beer. I'll put you on. But it's they don't understand like the the what it takes to just put stuff in kegs and put stuff how long it takes to steer your ship in the other direction you know it takes weeks yeah yeah and i mean i even saw some things where they're like you know restaurants can be open and you're sitting down you know you can have a beer at that restaurant but your tap room can't be open right where you can sit down and have a beer and i thought that was like it was so silly to me I w- and I'm not a guy that goes to a bunch of bars and drinks. Like, that's just not who I am all the right. time. If I get out, I take it home. And, yeah. you know, and I don't drink that much in, in the first place, but I do enjoy a good beer. I, I enjoy craft beer. I spend my money locally because mm-hmm. that's what I believe in. But um, it's it made me – I found myself getting upset when I was reading all these things and all these struggles from all the breweries because these rules seem to, like, have no sense. It didn't make any sense. Like, the – you know, they would even start serving a little bit of food, and then they'd be like, no, you can't do that. Like, well, you can have a beer at a restaurant. That yeah. lowers your inhibition just the same way, so you can't really you can't really say it's that part, right? So it was just, it was one of those things I wanted to get behind so bad. That's why I'm glad that you agreed to come on, because I, I there was a soft spot in my heart for all these little local businesses that are struggling, you know, and you've got two, and one's like, can't do anything. Yeah. that's That's got to, like, be gut-wrenching. It really was because just like what you just said, like there's no difference in going to a chain restaurant and you wear your mask till you get to your table and then you sit down and then we're in a big warehouse. We can put our tables eight feet apart, 10 feet apart. Yeah. We got a lot of room, but that was not allowed, you know, and the rules just to me didn't make sense because, you know, let's say you're going to go to a restaurant and let's say at that point, I think it was six per table. You, you could at that time during COVID, you could go to a restaurant with six people that did not live with you. You you could have had a friend that flew in from another state that day and you're taking them to lunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was okay to yeah. go sit with people that could be infected. You have no idea. But as long as you were sitting down and there was a plate of food in front of you, it, it, just, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. The bars and the, the breweries uh, really got a bad rap. They got, uh, uh, they were the scapegoat. You know, for these politicians who, you know, in my opinion, they they just uh, it was something that the general public was not going to raise a fuss about bars being closed. Yeah. And they didn't because when everybody was closed. Fair enough. You know, we're closed. Everybody's closed. They let us all open back up in June and then they shut us back down again, but only us. And that was not fair because of what we just talked about. You could go to a restaurant with people that you could have been there with three of the people in your group you may not have even known you don't know where they've been that day you don't know who they've talked to who they were might have been infected with you have no idea but it was okay because you were sitting down with food none of it made sense and we were the scapegoat and and i really believe that i think they used us as a scapegoat because the general public would not raise a fuss about bars being closed or tap rooms being closed but they made it look like the politicians made it look like they were they were being proactive. We're we're trying to stop this. Yeah. Look what we're doing. And the general public's like, yeah, okay, well, I don't really go to bars anyway. So whatever. The weird part where they're stuck, and if I had to see it from their eyes, which, I mean, I don't agree with any of it because there's right and wrong, and you got to make those decisions, right? Especially when you work for people. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to preface that for sure because I don't believe it's right. When they got a bunch of people screaming like nowadays where they just scream about everything and they're yeah. just wild, they got to look like they're doing something in their eyes. Like, yeah. they're like, I have to to stay elected, right? But it, I think it backfires on them when you don't take a stand for what you believe in is right, Yeah, if that makes sense. So, like, I, I think a lot of those little things are just a show, like you said, of where they can – look like they're putting forth effort into something that they have no clue how to fix because they're not doctors or epidemiologists or anything. And this thing's brand new and it's going, it's spreading, but they don't know how deadly it is yet. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what do we do? Well, we're going to do this, 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 and this. And well, like you said, nobody's going to raise a fuss about the the local breweries because they can go into their restaurant and get, so they're like, you guys look what we're doing. We're being safe. And so that they're, they're kind of stuck 
to their constituents of people who aren't really doing they're not invested in learning and so they're just like getting screamed at so they're like well in order to get reelected i have to look like i'm being proactive on some stuff and then you got to take the fall for that we do you know and then and you also the other reason i think is because the bars have tabc to to watch and enforce to make sure they're closed you know there's who's going to go around and make sure if they were going to close another sector of the industry hair salons right do they have enough sheriffs or whoever to go around and check every hair salon every gym everything i mean they, they did it for a while but it's kind of a it's one of those things like that's what tabc does they go to bars and they they are the the arm of the law for them right so they had a regulatory regulatory agency to enforce the closures and enforce to make sure rules the, the most frustrating thing about the second lockdown was that abbott said they were going to go around and tabc was going to come around and go visit all these places and make sure they were all you know uh doing what was needed to be done to be open and if not then you'd be shut down he said that on that friday and then on that monday he shut all the brewery tap rooms bars oh. all back down and i think out of the whole state they did several hundred visits um and they only found like three or four at that time in june three or four bars that they closed out of hundreds and he just blanket wiped everybody out again so that was very, 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 very frustrating. You know, at that point, I, I pretty much lost it. I was, <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, we, we had to adapt. We learned to adapt at this place. We, we did some, my, my business partner had a fantastic idea. We did, uh, we made brewery bonds. And so we were selling uh, kind of like back in World War II by, by bonds, war bonds, right? So we sold bonds for like 75 bucks, but they were maybe worth 100 or we'd sell them for 50 bucks and they were worth 75. And so, but you, you had to wait 30 days to to use it. It was like a gift card basically, right? But it was, um, so you're saving money because you're, you're getting more for what you pay. And then it brought cash flow into us because a lot of people bought them. So it definitely helped us out on that, that second. How did that rate. work? Did they come in and use the bonds here at this place or did they use it beer to go or did you make um, arrangements with? Well, other... at that point it was all to go. We couldn't open our tap room. So it was all yeah. to go. Um, they would order it on our website and then we, we mailed them. We actually printed these nice bonds and you know, for show, you know, and then we mailed them a gift card with it and it went out and uh, we mailed it to them. And then after 30 days they could come in and, and, um, uh, order like a case to go or growlers or whatever and then they'd, they'd swipe their cards so that's it awesome. worked out it brought in cash flow for us to help our tap room and then it was a, a, a hefty discount for for them right so and then being able to not use it right away they had to wait 30 days it let us kind of sit on that cash and pay bills with it you know oh, so it, it helped a it just idea. helped it was it was it was brilliant when he brought that up i was like man that's that's like reverse that's, credit <laughs> yeah yeah that's you know. really i mean that's I love when, see, this is one thing I talk about all the time is like this, the human spirit will find a way, Yeah. especially the entrepreneur, like mindset and attitude. Like how many people would have thought of that? Yeah. There's a lot of people that just go, woe is me. It's not going to work. I can't do it. What am I going to do? They're panicking. They're depressed and they're not thinking straight, but you guys kind of dug your heels in and, and he came up with the idea and you're like, yeah, let's run with it. Let's do it. Just, yeah. just like mentioning starting the bar at the concert and you did it. Yeah. You know, you, you've got this idea and you're like, well, let's go ahead and do it. What's wrong with it? What have we got to lose, right? Right. You know, but I love that the human human spirit and that attitude is like, no matter what's going on, the weirdness mm -hmm. and all the crazy stuff that's happening that you see on the news and it's pumping in, you guys are trying to feed your family and do this. But on top of that, this is like your little baby. Like yeah. this is something that you've built that you're emotionally attached to kind of like this is part of you. This is like every liquid in the in a keg and can is part of you and your co-owner right mm -hmm. so i imagine like i just love the i love the attitude of we're gonna make this work you know i love that story like it's it's fantastic to me that you did that where you reversed it you got some cash flow to keep product in and keep things moving and we're able to pay bills and then take care of everybody as it came in but man what a risk yeah, I mean, you know, and, and we had a lot of help, too. I mean, like our, our bank, you know, they put our uh, 
loan on hold for six months and uh our Dude, same thing awesome. with like the mortgage on the building the bank you know like hey we'll take six months of putting your mortgage on hold so did they just put it on hold or did they defer payments to the end or how did like were they were they legitimately like hey we're just going to freeze it and then you can start up in six months pretty much yeah that that's like which which was a huge help because that's about how long we were closed was six months so um we wouldn't have i, I don't think we would have survived if we didn't have that help because we weren't making enough selling to go and doing the brewery bonds like we were making enough to pay the electric bill and pay you know yeah. But we weren't, uh, I mean, we were all on unemployment. You know, I, I was on unemployment. My partner, our tapper manager, all of us were on unemployment, yeah. you know. I mean, <laughs> you know. That's a, when people, uh, so I grew up, we owned a business, right? And it was, it was a fairly decent sized business, actually. And, and people all the time be like, our employees, everybody would be like, you're rich, man. What's, what's that? And yeah, yeah. You're not. I, people don't realize all your money is back here. If you can yeah. see it, all his money's in there. Yeah. That's where his money is. Oh, yeah. And so it's like, it's a weird being on the other side. You yeah. know, you're like, oh, you don't really realize. It's it's hard. It's hard to understand something unless you've been through it. Yeah. You know, unless you live through it. Like, people don't know that it's hard for you to stay. Like, well, you're selling stuff in grocery stores. Why is it so hard for you to, like, stay afloat? Well, because you don't understand, like, you don't understand the process that it takes to make this and the money in front and i'm not getting paid for 60 days and now it's even worse and Mm -hmm. man it's just it's interesting to see the other side of it like how everything works yeah yeah um what is the best thing to do so if somebody wants to support this place like if if you if what's the best thing that the local people can do the public can do to help support these local breweries like grow and survive this time the, well, the absolute best thing you can do is go be in the tap room, get a beer, hang out. Um, because, you know, when, when you're selling to a grocery store, you're selling distribution. So you're, you're selling at a much cheaper price because the grocery store has got to, you know, everybody's got to make their cut, right? Um, but in the tap room, it's just like a bar or restaurant. That's where you make all your profit. That's why it's so many breweries focus a lot on their tap room and doing events and doing stuff um you know uh so the best thing you can do to help them out is buy beer directly in the tap room but even beer to go if you want to take it home that's the best thing too is to buy it from the brewery because we make more profit if you buy it here than we do selling it to a distributor they have their markup to go to the grocery store than the grocery you know so it's actually cheaper to buy it from us than to buy it from say HEB, but we make more profit if that makes sense oh yeah it makes total sense so that the best thing you can do is just buy straight from the source at any brewery you know buy from them buy your six pack to go buy a growler to go or hang out there and you know eat a burger and drink beer so you guys serve food here too we do now um so when we closed our restaurant we wanted to be out of the food game we we didn't want any part of it um so we spent a couple of years inviting food trucks to come here and the food trucks were some would come some wouldn't some would say they'd come and then they wouldn't show up you know um <laughs> that's, that's wild you know it is it was what it is there was uh but there was one food truck uh crafty pig i don't know if you ever had them their truck they were good i've seen it i have not so i haven't good. had it um they they actually started coming pretty regularly and um and we will i mean we do better when there was food here right but with the second lockdown when that hit for the bars and tap rooms and um the only way that they came out that we could open is if we had food so it became okay well we already know we can't get any food truck to commit to be in here all the time so we either have to put a kitchen in here or we have to have a food truck so our old chef from the restaurant um He's been working at uh, a few different places around town. Um, but I think with COVID, he had gotten laid off from the restaurant. He was he was at a, a hotel restaurant, and um, he, he got laid off. And then so we ended up calling him up, and then we partnered with him. And uh, so we the Crafty Pig, they were done. They weren't going to reopen. So they, oh, yeah, really? So they were, gonna get, were looking to get rid of their truck. So we were able to get their truck. So we have their truck now. And it's, it's, uh, so BWD Blackwater draw, it's yeah. just called BWD bites and our old chef from the Northgate location, he's, he's running it. 
So that was a good situation because we don't really want to be in the restaurant business, but we have to have food. But everybody loved our food, and we were probably more known for food than anything yeah. at the Northgate thing. So what better thing? We have our old chef making the same food we had at the restaurant out of that truck. So he's here every day. We're open now. Thursday, uh, or actually Wednesday through Sunday, he's here, and he's, he's making some of the old favorite menu items. Okay, so do you ever travel that truck around, like, and go to different events? He does. And stuff like yeah, that? he do? does. He does. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's here whenever the tap room's open, just because that's kind of the rules that yeah. we have to be open. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's more so now. Now bars are allowed to open, so technically he could drive around and do on other days, but um, it's kind of known now. We our customers now kind of expected to be here, so he does stuff whenever the tap room's closed. Um, he'll go do events. Like, and then during the day before we open, if there's a lunch event or something, he'll go do it. Man, what a hustler. Yeah, no, he works hard. He's a very hard <laughs> yeah, worker. That's, yeah. really, that's really hard to do, <laughs> yeah. to do all those things, to do extra events and then clean up and move it back over here and get ready for, you yeah. know, because he, you know, he's serving food over there and then coming back over here and prepping mm-hmm. for the customers. That's, that's wild, man. Yeah. What a, that's, that's awesome. It's cool that you were able to give a guy that got laid off a job, you know? Yeah. And I think that's one of the most important things about, like having your tap room open is it keeps people employed you know and mm-hmm. for people that haven't been here before all the when i drove up like this is the first time i've been here and all you've got all the places set up outside and like you said eight feet of, like if you want the safest place to come and enjoy food <laughs> and beverage without having to get close to people this is definitely it oh yeah like I'm it's a, without this room it's still probably a seven thousand square foot space you know yeah plus the tables outside so yeah, it's a it's a big area, you know. Yeah, and a cool atmosphere too, downtown Bryan. This is like a way cooler atmosphere than that. I mean, I'm not a Northgate guy in the first place. No offense to <laughs> to your bar that's down there. No offense, but, but you know, it's not. That's not my style of place, mm-hmm. you know. So this this is like definitely this is definitely a cool vibe, man. I dig it. Yeah, we're actually this room that we're in now. We we're about to. Uh, kind of reorganize it and clean it out i mean the guys on the camera can't see but there's a whole bunch of other cans and there's a portable bar over here we're about to move all this stuff out of here because we actually have two more bathrooms back here so uh pre-covid we were doing a lot of events we had baby showers corporate events we've had two weddings here we've had like actual weddings we've had uh everything rehearsal dinners everything so but with covid now i mean that's pretty much dried up nobody's really doing big events we've had a couple here and there but um right now we're getting asked for like we used to do events that were like 200 300 people now we're getting asked for a lot of events that are you know 20 people 30 people but a lot of them have been on friday and friday's the one day that we were like okay we'll we'll rent the brewery out on saturday we'll do it on wednesday thursday friday was the one day that we wanted to be open to the public they would know for a fact the brewery's open on friday but a lot of these people are asking for events on Friday now and smaller events. So I think we're going to we're going to clean all this out, put it all up against the wall. So this area is open, have tables. And then um, that other room you saw on the other side, that can be for events. Where are you going to store everything? Well, we're getting to that. <laughs> and we got high ceilings. We can stack things really high. But we got two bathrooms back here that, you know, we don't ever use. So yeah. we can... Uh, we can make this a seating area for the tap room and that can be the bathrooms. And then that other side can hopefully be for events. Cause that was a thing pre COVID that was a good revenue stream for us was hosting events and stuff. And that's kind of all done now, understandably just because, yeah. you know, yeah. Well, how has your relationship been through all this with your distributor and like that? Cause I'm, I'm sure they can just drop you if they want. Right. If it's not, I mean, you have contracts. I don't know how that, all that works, but I mean, is your relationship good there and have like the the retail outlets worked you know really supported local craft breweries especially like the hebs the kroger's walmart's and stuff like that yeah i mean the the retail outlets they're they're still ordering they're doing their thing the the thing that hurts the most is you know you walk into say heb and there's how many craft brands oh, right yeah. so you think about when you used to go in there there would be a brewery in there and they're sampling and we're not allowed to sample now, like HEB and all that. They won't allow you to go in there and set up and sample on a Friday or a Saturday. So um, 
you can't really showcase your beer. You're just on the shelf, and you got to hope that people, you know, pick your beer. Um, with the distributor, though, I mean, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, you know, pretty much everything. I mean, it just all slowed down. They weren't, they weren't ordering kegs or anything. Uh, now that the bars are open and the restaurants are back open and going, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's going. The distributors are a weird thing. Technically, yeah, they could drop you, but, uh, and they have, but it, it all depends on what's going on in the industry. We've seen, like the distributor we're with, they had, they were pretty much the local craft beer distributor. Let's say they had, I might not count them all, but let's just say they had like about a dozen Texas craft breweries um, that was under their portfolio. And I would say in the last two years, they've probably dropped half of them. Oh my at gosh. Least. But that's just the, the brewery scene. I mean, you got to figure uh, the the hard seltzers came out, like uh, White Claw and Truly. That really hammered the, the, the craft brewery scene for – it's kind of starting to mellow out a little bit, but um, at the beginning it hurt, you know. Um, liquor's on the rise, has been on the rise for a while. So craft breweries, the, the beer business, you know, say 10 years ago or even let's just say five years ago, has really started to level off it's not showing the exponential growth that it that it was say 10 years ago right yeah um liquor's more on the rise the the seltzers there's just other that's a whole new category in its own that's not going away. which is weird to I mean, me. you got natty light making seltzers now yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> well you everybody know. jumps on whenever it starts to work you know you yeah. see it wait for a little bit white claw starts to pick up and it's like oh wait we all need to make a seltzer now yeah. you got cores making a seltzer you got yeah. Uh, the weird thing to me is that, like I love sparkling water Topo Chico is my favorite stuff like that that's awesome but if I want to drink that I'm going to drink a Topo Chico if I want yeah. a beer I'm going to drink a beer you know like that's my attitude but I guess I get it like there's less calories in it and yeah. all that stuff if you want to watch your weight I'd really go work out and have a good beer yeah <laughs> you know it's, yeah. A, it's awesome I mean and I kind of maybe it's the nostalgia part but I kind of love the craftsmanship of making beer because it is kind of craft isn't it it definitely is. I mean, I, you, there's probably over 300 breweries just in Texas. I mean, there's, you know, probably, I don't even know, maybe over 8,000 maybe in the U.S. now. I don't I don't remember the last time what the last number was. But, you know, everybody makes an IPA, but they're all different. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're all, the style of beer of an IPA, you can drink it and go, yeah, that's an IPA. But they're all different. Every single one of them, and that's where the craftsmanship comes in, because we're all using basically the same ingredients, the same hops. You know, certain IPAs will have different hops than others, but you know, it's all in how you how you mix it, how you you know put the the artistry into it to get your beer. So. Does it is that a long process for you to like figure out with the flavors that you have? Do you, I mean, when you make a flavor, do you have to make this big gigantic barrel of it, or do you make small barrels first and try it? And then does that transfer over into the big barrel? So, okay, uh, perfect question because that, see that system right there is our, that's the first thing we ever bought. We were still, oh, that, we were the we, two keg with the keg right thing, yeah. So that, that brews like one keg at a time. Um, oh, that's awesome. How cool is that? I don't know. They probably can't see it. I can move it. move it. I can, I can pick it up. So, you ever move it the right way? See yeah, that two cake thing right there? Right. The two cake thing. There. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one keg at a time. Um, and when we were building our restaurant, we made that. We, we were, we were kind of testing recipes on that. So one keg at a time. And then we, what we did at the restaurant is we would test batch on that and then move it up to the seven barrel. When we opened this place, we would test batch on that, put it in our tap room at the restaurant. If it did good, we'd brew it at the restaurant. If it did really good there, then we'd move it over here to the bigger tanks but we don't really even use that anymore now the tanks from the restaurant they brew 14 kegs at a time that's that's like our test system now. that's your so, tester because yeah. i mean everything levels up with eventually like mm -hmm. you know i i get that part it's uh what do you do if you taste it you go, do you ever taste it i guess and you're like oh no this is not good it's happened a couple of times um we made a hef one time at our restaurant and Hefts can be a little difficult to make. Um, you got to get the temperature just right to get the flavors out of it that you want. And it was, uh, I, I didn't like it. People loved it. 
Really? <laughs> it sold. It sold. It sold almost faster than any beer we did at the at the restaurant. It flew, and yeah. I just I absolutely hated it. I I hated it. But you know, teach their own. You know. Well, I guess that's my next <laughs> question. Is like, you've got a taste for what you like. Your co-owner has a taste for what he likes. Yep. But, I mean, uh, there's everybody has a different like style yep. that they like some yep. people like sour beers some like it more sour than others like yeah. i've tasted some sour beers i'm like goodness gracious it just tastes like a rotten thing <laughs> you know yeah. but then some sour beers i love mm -hmm. but it's it's like a how do you what's the process as far as for you guys of figuring out what your hitters are that you're going to go with putting on tap and selling out to the public i mean we we have our core beers that are year round that we make and then we have our our play around beers that we sell to the public uh a few of those will release to certain bars that are maybe our top accounts and stuff mm -hmm. but they don't all go to the grocery store a lot of them are just for tap room only you got to come here to get it um but on that like my partner chris he's the the brewer right so you listen to him talk he's always described beer as like food like you think of a chef like he's talking about the ingredients to make a meal and he's talking about different garlic or whatever that's kind of the way he talks about beer making a, a cuisine right it's it's he describes it all as 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 the same very similar to making food so uh really you just get kind of an idea in your head of the basic style you want i want to do a, a porter or i want to do a stout or i want to do an ipa whatever and then you build on it from there you know do we just want to do a classic porter the like a robust porter that you know or do i want to put coffee in it or do i want to put uh, Mexican vanilla stout like you just drank, you know, um, which is delicious, by the way, it's, it's almost <laughs> empty. <laughs> so, yeah, we just we just uh, play around with it. You know, we're about to do a, 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 a cookie pairing, like different flavors of cookies. How do you put cookies in there? Well, we're not going to put the cookies in there, but we're going to make the beers complement the cookies and then do like a whole three or four beer, three or four cookie pairing that we're going to. You know, whether it's cinnamon or nutmeg or I got gotcha. you know, or peanut butter or whatever, we're gonna make four or five beers and pair them with cookies and have a big deal with it. We're I've always wondered probably how, in March or so. I April. always wonder how you do that. And then when you're doing the coffee stuff, it, like messing around with that, like you pour actual coffee in it. Yeah, yeah. We we partner with a local company called What's the Buzz. Uh -huh. they, they roast their own coffee. Yeah, so. yeah. Really cool um, guy. He, uh, Rodrigo's been on the podcast. Yeah, Rodrigo. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we get his uh, Tanzanian pea berry coffee and we uh, we cold brew it and. Uh, and put it right in it's got right in the beer it's got coffee in it that dude makes really good coffee mm -hmm. that, yeah. he's very smart too mm -hmm. like he's incredibly smart i was sitting there like nerding out on because i love coffee mm -hmm. and i was nerding out like when he was talking about this is exciting i love this stuff <laughs> i could listen to you talk all day man right <laughs> yeah it's wild kind of the same thing with you with beer like i like i want i just like want to know the whole process it's it, it's not anything that i'm ever going to do but it's fascinating yeah like it's awesome to I, I think the time, any, anything that somebody puts time and effort into and makes something like an, an art and then you put it out there in the world for somebody to taste and approve or disapprove of you. Right. Is what is, is very vulnerable, you know, like you're like, Hey, I really like this beer. Now I got to see if X, Y, Z likes the beer. Yeah. And if they go, the first person tasting goes, Oh, I don't like that. You're like, Man, that's like a, it's it's wild. It's wild to do. It's a weird step for you to take. Yeah, like it's, it is a weird step. Like, but I it's mean, rewarding too. I mean, like you know, I got the bar. Like I own a bar, and it, it's fun, and it's got its own rewarding things about it. But it's not my product, right? That that we make that we're selling. We're selling Jameson, and we're selling Guinness, and we're selling Saint Arnold, and we're selling, you know. Here it's like something that we made, and it's right. ours. It's our brand. So that's probably to me the most rewarding thing. You know, is it something that's ours that we're selling? Yeah, that's yeah. gotta that's gotta be. Way, the risk is higher. The reward is higher. It's mm -hmm. not just monetarily. I'm, I imagine. I mean, I don't know if the bar makes you more money when it's blown and going because that's a popular bar down. Mm -hmm. You know, down there, uh, especially when the bands come. I've been there. You know, I love. Like I said, I love the Irish rock bands, mm -hmm. and that place is packed. Like, I mean, people are just everywhere and drinks are flying. I mean, business has to be great there. But um, this, I would imagine emotionally, because you're putting your craft into it, you know, 
it's not somebody else's product you're doing. This is your product you built from the ground up. Right. And when somebody buys it, it's like, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Or if we do a big beer release here and a lot of people come, you know, or, you know. How, how do people find out about beer releases? Do you have to pay attention to the website? Do you have to follow you on Facebook? Like, how Face, does that go? Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. yeah. We have a website, but it, and we'll throw events up there. If you go to, like, the event section, it's on there. But it's real easy on the website to forget about it and like oh, oh we gotta get back on there and yeah you know and I, I get on there and i'll put events on there but uh with covid we haven't really done that many events most of it's just like like on wednesdays and thursdays we do all the beers three bucks so we're calling that an event but it's it's a beer special you know yeah um first friday was an event but um how have those been going the first, first fridays. fridays man it, it's a shame like hands down busiest day of the month for everybody downtown oh it's wonderful it's Always, an awesome right? it's an awesome you know, event. if anybody's yeah. never like ever been it's it was really it's a really cool but it's place. been it's been it's been bad it's been it for they're no i mean they they didn't do them at all for a while when covid first started right and then once places started to kind of open back up they tried to do like a virtual first friday and that just that, not gonna work that that's not that the same thing um they're to the point now where they they still they, they're blocking <laughs> off the street but there's no street vendors. There's no music on the. There would be like live music on every corner, yeah. right? So they're not doing that. Um, so now it's like, it's more about just come down and support local business. Which you know, hey, it's first Friday. Let's go support local business. But it's without all that ambiance and of, of, of what it used to be. The the sales are not close to what they used to be. You know, it's. When do you think it goes back to I, I don't normal? Know. I don't know. You know, you'd like to think that there's a vaccine now and you know i, I know biden's talk, i don't want to get too political but i know he's talked about doing the 100 days of masks but i mean we're already doing that now anyway yeah. but you know maybe maybe you give it three months of his deal and the vaccine and maybe it's not going to go away but maybe it'll just not be politicized as much or COVID's here it's going to be here yeah but maybe it'll just Maybe with the vaccine, it'll help. I don't know. Maybe I, it'll just kind of. I guess, have you seen my quest? Like, because what I'm kind of noticing is people are, they're more and more getting used to it being here, like you said. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more people that are starting to, like, I don't want to say, relax isn't the right word. It's because they're not relaxed. They're, they're just a little more aware of it, but also they're like, man, we got to start living a little bit. Like, that was terrible, what we just did. It was horrible. You know, and so. Like I, I see a lot of a lot a lot of people working around it and a little less fearful. Have you seen that here where there's a, the people are a little less fearful to come in and buy stuff like business picking up? Yeah, I think I think here it's been getting a little bit better for sure. Um, there, there's still the people that buy to go stuff that you can tell they're a little apprehensive about it, but um, I, I think business has picked up a little bit started it's not back to where it was pre-covid sure. but i do see it starting to pick back up you know the to-go sales the one thing it did for us is like our tap room january february was really starting to take off our to-go sales they, they were okay covid what that did for us is our our to-go sales obviously it was like showcasing it was like oh i can buy it directly from them so and i think people are figuring it out like I can buy it directly from them and it's cheaper than going to the store, right? So yep. the to-go sales have actually still been pretty steady. Um, but at the same time, our tap room sales on premise, people drinking here, has started to come back a little bit. It's not fully there, but it is starting to creep back up. So I think, you know, I think the vaccine itself is going to give people a lot of confidence. It's it's all about consumer confidence. That, know? Yeah, I guess that's what I was you trying know? to say. What you just said is perfect. It's consumer confidence. It's like I'm not hating on to people that want to get to go or want this or what that. I just want to see businesses thrive, like local businesses. You yeah. know, I, I'm as fantastic as Amazon is and big things. I have a soft spot in my heart for somebody who builds something from the ground up and like. You're not making millions of dollars. You just like those people are literally surviving off the local community and yeah. this little tribe. And when that tribe starts buying everything away from the tribe, it has no more support. Yeah. And so I like 
I want to see people like support the local things. I guess that's why I asked you how they can support local crafts, like whether you're in Austin, Houston, or here. Like if you're in Bryan College Station and you know it's what? I mean, everything in Bryan College Station is 10 minutes away, right? 15 right. minutes away. You 15 extra minutes to come by and support somebody and give that family a paycheck, you know? Like, yeah. Basically, you're you're going by getting the same thing that you would get normally at, at, at the store for convenience, but just take a little bit more time. Instead of spending money, spend your time to go over there and buy that from that local place and support them. And that keeps this economy rolling. That keeps you open. And then when everything does, you know, it'll allow it to give a slow build back and a safe build back up to, like, this thing that, you know, maybe you figure something out by that time frame. You know, maybe it keeps you afloat enough to figure out a slightly different way to do business that brings the same revenue in. Right. You know, because yep. you already thought of something on the fly. Like, I mean, yeah. it didn't take you very, you're like, oh man, I got to think of something now. Yeah. Give you some time and what can you do, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, so I guess, I guess you said it perfectly. Consumer confidence is what the, you know, what the, the most important thing that needs to happen. And then also if, if you're not, like if you're if you're not confident, if you're still like worried about it, which is perfectly justified, just do to go orders. That yeah, yep, yep. Awesome. Yeah, man. we're not making anybody come out. Like we're not making <laughs> you sit in there. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the same with restaurants too. I mean, like local restaurants, like they're not, they can all sell food to go. You know, they can. A lot of them cater. So if they. Can, but that's it's still rough. You know, like you know, being in the food service business, your margins of what you run, yeah. and that's I guess that's one thing too that. I would, I know from working in the food distributor side of things, that's the business we own, kind of like a Cisco or Benny mm -hmm. Keith or that, is that, I mean, you're, if you tell a restaurant that they've got to run 25% capacity off their margins, their margins are based off 100% capacity. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're basically, you know, that they're they're done. Like, they can't even pay the light bill. With well, that, that that's thing. even, that's why the whole capacity thing, I don't really get because... If, if, if you say, I mean, we got a big building here, so, but let's just take, if you got a place that's, say, 2,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet, if you're a little restaurant, right? If they say you're at 50% capacity, or let's say right now they're at 75% capacity, they're really not. Because if you have to separate every table out to be six feet apart and try to squeeze in up, maybe up to 10 people per table, to get all them around that, you're going to have to scoot those other tables apart farther. If they're doing it by the rules, they're never going to hit 75% capacity. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to. Yeah. So that's the other struggle, you know, that people don't realize is that, oh, they're at 75% capacity, but they're probably not. They're probably really operating at 50, you know. Yeah. And I, I guess that's one of my goals is to open people's eyes. It's not to, like, make a political statement or say that it should be or shouldn't be. It's to let people know, like, when they look at something that says 25%, why aren't you, like, you still can do to-go orders. Yeah. What's the big deal? Well, it takes a lot of money to keep this open, and I built this business off of this, and now immediately, like, it was running on this, and now, wham, so now you're making adjustments. So in order for people to keep the thing that they love and that, they've got to figure out a way to support them. Yep. You know, so I guess that's I want to open people's eyes to that sort of thing where they understand because on their end, I can see where they can imagine like, well, it's not that bad. Right. It's, they're going to make it. But but they've never had the restaurant. They've never had the brewery. They've never lived through that. They just know the business that they're in, you know, or working for somebody that's in it. So they've never had to do balance those things out. So right. I guess that's my 100% goal, like especially with something like this that we're doing, is that they understand that, you know, hey, th it is way tougher than just what they've, than just that percentage mark. You can't just put a hard number on that because there's so many things that go yeah. into it, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get let everybody know what what's the address here. The address is 701 North Main. So if you're coming to downtown Bryan, you get on the main drag right there i call it main drag but the, where most of the plate like right at where uh uh the queen theater and all that is yep uh you just keep going north all the way till it dead ends at martin luther king you got the old ice house right there we're right there at the corner of of uh maine and martin luther king 
And then how do they get the beer to go? Like if people want to order the beer to go? You can either just come in and order it straight from us, or you can go to our website, which is uh, blackwaterbrew.com. Okay, and then just place the order and then come and pick it up. And yeah, we'll get go. a little notification and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send you a thing that says, yes, we got your order, come pick it up. You know, that way, because some people order it like in the morning or something, and uh, so we don't open until say five or three, depending on the day. So once we're here and we are open, we'll send you a little message that says, hey, your order's ready, and then you come get it. Right on, man. All right, well, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, Come and support Blackwater Draw. Order some stuff to go. Come have a beer in the in the tap room. What did I have again? You had the uh, Shut Up Meg. Shut Up Meg. It's a <laughs> vanilla porter, right? Mexican vanilla stout. Yeah. Mexican vis- vanilla stout. I guess it was really stout because I'm having trouble talking about it. <laughs> it's it's awesome. It's delicious. Um, I highly suggest it. And support local businesses. Hope everybody enjoyed it, man. Chris, thanks a lot. Yeah, this man. Was a fantastic Thank you. Appreciate it. All right.